hello everybody, it's Angie the Coder, and today we're going to talk about CEUs and keeping in each other accountable for doing our CEUs. Recently, I turned in 36 CEUs that I did all in the span of about a month, which is nuts. The AAPC gives us two years to get our CEUs done, and I did all of mine, almost all of mine, in one month and it was painful and I don't wish that on any of you guys so I decided that starting in September because that's when my um, next round of CEUs start that I would um, create sort of an opportunity to encourage you guys to do your CEUs on a monthly basis sort of just sort of a way that we can keep each other accountable so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do some free CEUs every month and this month it'll be done via um, via video, but in the future, I think I'm going to do them as a Facebook Live or a YouTube Live. You guys let me know in the comments below whether you prefer Facebook Live or YouTube Live. But without further ado, we're going to jump into CEUs for September. So let's go. What we're going to do today is we're going to do free, some free CEUs, and we're just going to go out here. I'm, I'm logged on as, on my APC account, and I'm going to go to Education. I'm going to go to Free CEUs. And then I'm just going to go down here where it says test exercises, test yourself exercises. And I'm going to click on health business, health business monthly. And we're going to work the one that is September. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and pull the magazine up if it'll come up so you can see it. It's a beautiful magazine this month. It's just very well done. So there it is. Pretty, huh? <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to, do the, we're going to go over the test together. Now, I'm not giving you the answers. Um, we're just going to discuss the test. This is a printed version of what the test looks like, the test yourself. And you can do this yourself. You can go on there and put a, do a printed version of it, which I recommend printing a version. And when you're reading your newsletter, as you see the answers to the test, you can just mark them off. All right, so let's just jump on in. So the first question is, Designating a month for prostate cancer awareness serves the purpose of A. Increasing public awareness of the importance of prostate health and prostate cancer awareness. B. Providing easy, accessible prostate health screening and prostate cancer screenings. C. Educating about prostate health, risk factors, and symptoms of prostate cancer. D. Advocating for further research on prostate health issues and prostate cancer, or E, all of the above. So what I want you to do right now is pause the video and go out and read the article about, it's called Go Blue. I'll show you. Hold on. Let's go out there. All right, so this article actually starts on page 12. It's called Go Blue for Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. And the question that we had was about um, what's the purpose of having a Prostate Cancer Awareness Month? And let's see if we can find the answer to our question. Mm -hmm. All right, go blue. If you flip down to page 14, I think it is. Let's make sure. We're going to read all about go blue. September, Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. I did not know that until I read this article. See, I learned, already learned something. Um, is time when communities nationwide come together to increase awareness of prostate cancer and the importance of prostate health and screenings. Health experts and advocates committed to encouraging men to take a more proactive role in protecting their health are working hard this month to educate about risk factors and symptoms of prostate health to provide easily acceptable prostate cancer screenings and advocate for further research on prostate health issues and prostate cancer. Empowering men with educational tools and resources helps them to make informed choices about prostate screening, care, and treatment. So go blue. Now let's go back. Question number two. According to the USPSTF, all right, anyway, let me just read it again. According to the US. PSTF, that's a lot of letters there. Recommendations, men ages 55 to 69 should be screened periodically for prostate cancer until they are 70 years old. Is this true or false? I think I saw it up here. Okay, here are the screening recommendations, and this is page 13. 
Early detection and advancements in treatment are saving lives. According to the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, that's what the USPSTF is, um, their recommendations are that men ages 55 to 69 should talk with their health care providers to help them decide if prostate screening cancer is right for them. For number three, which code would you report for a screening PSA for a Medicare recipient? Would it be GO103? Would it be 84152, 84153, or 84154? Now remember, this is for a Medicare patient, and this is for a PSA, which is prostate screening, um, screening exam. So let's, or screening lab. So let's go look at that. So if we go back in here, and it's in the next article which is a great article. You, I, I actually learned some stuff from this article. I thought I understood PSA test coding, and this actually helped me learn some things I, I wasn't really aware of. So I definitely recommend you read this article and make some notes. But tip number one, determining screening or diagnostic. When the urologist documents that they performed a PSA test, dig a bit deeper. Some payers, including Medicare, have different coding requirements for screenings and diagnostic PSA tests. For Medicare patients, report a screening PSA with GO103, prostate cancer screening, prostate specific antigen test. Question number four, how often does Medicare cover PSA screening tests for men aged 50 years or older? Is it A, every six months, B, every 12 months, C, every 18 months, or D, every 24 months. So let's go back to our article. And you'll see um, tip number three right here. It talks about frequency limits. Once you decide on these codes, there's only one more point to check before submitting the claim. Payers have tight restrictions on frequency for which they will pay PSA tests. Medicare, for example, covers the screening PSA test once every 12 years for men 58, 50 years old or older, as instructed in the Claims Processing Manual, Chapter 18, Section 50. So the next question, five, says, what is the Greek word for cell? Let's go out there to the newsletter and see where in the world would that answer be. Is it A, carcino, B, cyto, C, colo? or D, septo. All right, let's go to the article. Okay, um, I'm, I flipped a little bit fast for you there, sorry about that. But on page 16, I believe it is, yeah. On 16, there's a great article about tips for memorizing medical terminology. If you have a, a test to take on terminology or if you just wanna bone up on your terminology, this is a really good article about how to do that. And if you look under tip number one, it talks about break it down, and it talks about how most of our medical terms are derived from the, the Latin or the Greek, right? And underneath there, they tell you to create some flashcards or spreadsheets with the word parts that you want to memorize, and there is a small sample of some of the common Greek and Latin words and uh, what they mean. So if you take a look at them, well, whoop, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm trying not to cheat here, but um, let's zoom in a bit. Find your word. I'm not going to point it out to you, but it's on the little sheet there. Find your word, and it'll tell you what it means, or what your, it's actually your root word. Find your little root word, and it will tell you what it means. Question number six. What are the benefits of using flashcards to learn A and P, which is anatomy and physiology? A, they are visually stimulating and trigger a connection to the medical term. B, they're cost effective. C, they test your memory so you can retain information. Or D, all above. So we're going to go back to the same article and see if we can't find the answer. All right, here we are in the same article. Like I said, it's a really great article, especially if you need to study for something. And if you go to number five, it says, tip number five, make flashcards and form study groups. Flashcards are an effective, cheap study tool for those who learn through visual stimulation and association. They work by creating a visual trigger between terms and definitions. You may be able to pr uh, purchase pre-made flashcards for medical terminology. If you make them yourselves, however, you earn the bonus points for memory retention. 
Studying with others can be an effective way to learn because you can challenge and help each other. Meet with your group regularly to review the chosen materials. And don't forget to bring your flashcards. Yeah, maybe we should have some study groups. Wouldn't that be fun? I kind of miss having study groups. All right, sorry, I digress. Let's go back to the test. All right, question number seven. Now, this was a good article, guys. This was something I didn't know anything about this stuff. I learned so much today, uh, today when I was doing my CEUs. Number seven, what three criteria does CMS use to determine eligibility for NTAP? A, safety, effectiveness, effectiveness and cost. B, newness, safety, and cost. C, sa safety, cost, substantial clinical improvement. Or D, newness, cost, and substantial improvement. Let's go take a look at this article, which I think is a really good article for everybody to read. Okay, here's the article. It starts on page 22, and it's all about add-on payments that encourage the uptake of new technology. So the first thing I want to do really quickly here is tell you what in the world an NTAP is, because I did not know. I'm excited that I learned something really new today. An NTAP is additional payment made to the hospital, let me zoom in, for inpatient stays on top of the lump sum reimbursement rate. Um, this additional payment is provided to offset some of the cost of new drugs and devices when certain criteria are met. For most drugs and devices, this offset, or NTAP, is limited to 65% of the medication or device cost, an increase from 50% in 2019. Um, a given technology's NTAP designation lasts no more than three years for a specific indication. So that's what an NTAP is. NTAP is. I needed to know because I'd never heard of one, but our question was about the criteria. What are the criteria to qualify for NTAP? Newness. The drug or device must be new. It cannot be substantially similar to existing technologies. Medications and devices are considered new until claims data reflecting the use of that therapy become available. Now, let's see. Get to the next one. Cost. Reimbursement for the cost of the drug or device must be inadequate under the current existing MSDRG. This cost criterion is demonstrated in a complex formula. So cost. And lastly, clinical improvement. The use of the drug or device must significantly improve clinical outcomes as compared to co currently available treatments. Clinical data must be applicable to the Medicare patient population. If the therapy has received a breakthrough designation by the Food and Drug Administration, this criteria will be met. Okay, so uh, if you <laughs> don't feel bad if you didn't understand all of that, neither did I. A lot of this has to do with inpatient hospital coding, which is not my cup of tea, but we do have our answers here. So, criteria one, two, three. Let's go back to our test. Question number eight What percent of costs will CMS reimburse on QIDPS? that have been approved for NTAP. Now remember, NTAP was about the new technologies uh, add-on payment for inpatient, right? So the question is, what percent of costs will CMS reimburse on QIDPs that have been approved for the NTAP? So let's go back to our newsletter. See if we can remember all that. <clears throat> all right. I'm cheating a little bit here, sorry. I'm going to zoom in on this paragraph because I saw real quickly they were talking about QIDPs. And I'm going to tell you what a QIDP is because it's right above. And believe me, I did not know this until I saw it in the article. So thank you, whoever wrote this article. If you look above this paragraph, it says that QIDP stands for Qualified Infectious Disease Product. So that's interesting. Um... A QIDP is a Qualified Infectious Disease Product. So starting in the fiscal year 2021 application cycle, CMS will consider QIDPS as new and not substantially similar to existing technology. This means that QIDPS will not need to meet the substantial clinical improvement requirements to be eligible for NTAP. Add-on payments for QIDPs will also increase to 75% of the cost of the product or 
the additional cost of the case, whichever is lower. Okay, so that gets us through the first eight questions of the test. YouTube only allows me to put videos that are about 15 minutes um, long out. So I'll have to do the second part of the test in a separate video. So be looking for that real soon. In the meantime, you guys have a great day and I'll see you back for the second half. And uh, when we finish taking our test, I want you guys to put in the comments field below how well you did on the test. Did you pass it the first time? I hope you did. See you later. Bye.